So what we've seen in our last video is the way in which the equality that's established by this auction can be destroyed over time through things that occur by luck, things that are not in our control, but that it has to be a certain kind of luck that throws a wrench into things. What we call brute luck versus options luck. That options luck can already figure into the auction because each of us are choosing not a particular point for our resources, but we're choosing a certain kind of life over time, and that includes all the risks and gambles that we choose to either take or not take, and that's part of the total price or metric in the auction. But what about brute luck? And when brute luck occurs, is there a way for us to orient the auction so that we can change brute luck into a kind of options luck and therefore rescue the principle of envy from being violated. That's what we want to talk about in this video. And the way in which we need to understand this is to understand that brute luck could come in many different ways. And he says we can generally divide brute luck into two types or two types of situations. The first is the situation where people are generally equal in their pre-established endowments or talents, but their circumstances are different. They have different circumstances that are not under their control. And so let's talk about that first, okay? So think of it like this. Let's go back to our example of Claude and Adam. Let's say Claude and Adam again buy the same kind of land with the same basic value, and they start off, though, with the same talents and the same ambitions. So both Claude and Adam want to become coconut farmers. And they have the same talent, so they, they have the same ability to, ex to develop their land to make a profit. And if all things go the same for them, they are equal competitors, right? But things don't always go the same. We say that what happens in Claude's side of the island is that there is a um, parasite that gets into his trees and destroys his crop. Whereas for Adam, that doesn't happen. That's a form of brute luck. The brute luck of two people with equal talents and equal choices for life start out the same, but the circumstances are such that Adam wins out. And thus we see that Claude would rationally prefer Adam's life to his own. Okay? Now when we consider that situation, as long as we leave it at that level, we can't have equality of resources here, can we? But this is Dworkin's great idea. He says, look, if we think about the insurance market, that's the point of insurance, isn't it? Is to take an unforeseen or an uncontrollable circumstance and foresee it and protect against it by insuring yourself. So a great example of this is doctors, right? When doctors practice, they get malpractice insurance. Why do they have malpractice insurance? Against the bad luck that a patient sues them because they couldn't heal them. And so thus the doctor takes something which is brute luck and transforms it into options luck by foreseeing that circumstance as a risk and then insuring against it, making a bet. Now what's the bet? Well, the bet is this, that that might occur and if it does, I'm going to pay money in advance so that I can get what? More money in the future just in case it occurs to recover any losses that I, that I make. Of course, if I don't win that bet, then that's still okay because the idea of insurance is that the premium should be low enough that it doesn't hurt me to pay the premium even if I never get a payout from the event actually occurring. And so thus it's rational to buy insurance against brute luck. But then what I do is I transform through that insurance brute luck 
into options lock. Now, not only can I think of external circumstances as being things like that, but I can think of handicaps. For example, say I'm a singer. I'm an opera singer. I'm Pavarotti. And Pavarotti is the most famous tenor in opera, right? We all heard of him. But what if he were to get laryngitis so bad that he would lose his singing voice? Then he would lose a fundamental aspect of his life, would be handicapped to the point where he would lose the ability to enjoy the life that he was leading. That would be an example of brute luck, wouldn't it? In other words, one way that brute lucks can occur for negative circumstances is what you might call through a handicap, losing your voice for Pavarotti, for the pianist losing their, getting arthritis in their fingers. So what might Pavarotti do? Well, he might go on and insure his throat, right? There are people who do this, actually. Singers who have done this, who insured their singing voice. And in doing that, what they're doing is taking the gamble that by paying some money right now to protect against this occurring, they can then have assurance that even if they lose their voice, they won't, it won't be a total loss for them. So, thus corresponding to this marketable talents the same, but circumstances different for Claude and Adam, we can then put on our auction a new market, an insurance market. And the question is, though, is if, of course, we're not on an island, right? We're not at the beginning of things. We don't, we don't have this opportunity at the very beginning of our lives to buy insurance like this, right? So how would that translate over into real practice? Well, again, we use the example of the person who's on the island. If insurance would go up for these various possible handicaps, blindness, deafness, tornadoes, we can put all of these as external circumstances because they're things that are outside of our control and that could happen that would put a clink in our lives, i.e. that would prevent us from continuing to experience the maximal amount of resources that we're entitled to as a result of our choices. And so what he says is, let's call this handicap insurance, okay? Now, of course, since we can't have the auction, we, can, we have to consider if the auction were to occur, what would be the premiums that people would insure themselves on, at? And those premiums would have to be decided in a certain and fair way, because when you think of insurance, right, you realize that insurers are gambling that you don't have that condition or that that's not going to occur. The reason why house insurance tends to be a good deal is precisely because it's very rare that your house is going to be destroyed by some hazard. And of course, if you burn it down yourself, then you're not going to get the insurance. So the key is, is the, both the insurance company and you are gambling when you give this. And what makes it a wise gamble is for the insurance company, the lack of likelihood that this will occur and that they're gonna to have to pay out. And for you, the security that you get from that, protecting from that likelihood, and also the lowness of the premium that allows you to buy that security without too much expense on the rest of your life. So thus we can imagine again, in the auction insurance, handicap insurance is put on the market. And then we can ask ourselves, is there a rational way of, of determining how, what the average immigrant, how, what kind of level of courage they would buy on what handicaps? And if we can do that, then we would have what the premium or level that each would buy at, that the average person in the auction would buy in the initial. And then, since we're not having the auction, what we can then do is take that premium as the level of tax that we would put, the government would put on each person to protect against the likelihood of handicaps and therefore allow a equal distribution. So the way he looks at it is what we would then do in our initial auction 
is we could actually just figure how, how that would be by looking at actual insurance policy. But of course, the thing is, is that usually we don't know simply because we don't know how our lives would be different specifically if that handicap hadn't occurred or if it will occur. But he says, in the general cases of circumstantial handicaps, in other words, things that don't occur from you at the very beginning of your life, like talents, they're such that we have a general idea of what would be, how our life would be different if that handicap were to occur. And so therefore, the average customer for insurance would have an idea of what they would buy and how much they would buy on what handicap. And thus, we could have this possibility of at least a going price or premium that the customer is willing to buy. But also, insurance companies play on odds, don't they? So, for example, if you are someone who is likely to go blind, then insurance company is going to charge you a much higher price for insurance against going blind than someone who's got perfect 20-20 vision and it looks like they're not going to go blind except for some weird, strange occurrence like being struck by lightning in the eyes or something like that. And so thus, what we see is in the actual insurance markets, the rates are going to vary and it's going to be unfair because it's going to be based on the probabilities of each person on how likely they are. We see this in health insurance and life insurance, that life insurance companies, the older you get, the higher the premium because the more likely you're going to die. And so really young, fit people are going to get better rates for insurance than those who are old with diabetes and cancer. So thus, if we're going to make it fair, he says, what we have to do is we have to imagine that all the immigrants are such that the odds of them getting each of these handicaps are equal. So that we're not going to charge this Claude more than Adam since, you know, Claude's on the side of the island where it's more likely he's going to get bull weevils or something like that. And so, thus we see that we, were able, we would, at least in principle, be able to get a premium and a level that the average immigrant would insure themselves at and would buy, be willing to buy an initial auction. Then we, what we do is assume the risks are equal, and thus we're going to get a flat rate for everybody. And now since we're not having the auction, we transfer that over into real life by charging a tax. A tax that everyone is, is able to afford, for the most part, in our auction distributed society, and one that if they were put in that auction, they would have bought. And so we're not violating either their choice, their res we're respecting their rights to choose their life, but we're also not violating equal concern because we're treating everyone the same and giving them the same opportunities and the same protections against hazards. Thus, by adding insurance as a tax into our society, we turn brute luck into option luck, and we therefore rescue the principle of equality from the principle of envy. But that's only the first time, right? But we know that the real problem is what if you have a situation where Claude and Adam aren't equal in talent, right? The initial distribution gives them initially equal resources through the auction, but because Claude is not as talented as Adam in doing what he wants to do, and they both have the same ambitions, then obviously, then it's going to be such that we're going to have a new kind of brute luck, right? The kind of brute luck that you might say you're out of luck, precisely because you just don't start at the same point that Adam starts at. And therefore, you are always going to be behind Adam and your resources, even though you both prefer the same kind of life and you'd be willing to pay the same kind of price for it. That's much more difficult to simply do insurance on. In our next video, what we will see is how he says there's a sense in which we can still associate a kind of insurance with a lack of talent or employability. But we have to do it in a way that doesn't preset what talents are 
the ones you should insure for. Because here's the big problem. The big problem is, in different societies, different talents are valued, valued, aren't they? And so that we really cannot say which talents or skills are going to get you ahead in life until we understand the market for the talents. In other words, what talents are employable or marketable. That will then determine which talents lead to a better distribution than and that's something that we don't have knowledge until the society actually works itself out. So this is going to be one of our big problems with setting up an insurance market for underemployability, as he's going to call it.